today. Great to see you online on site. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Tanja Käse. She's a senior track assist professor and head of the machine learning for education laboratory here at EPFL. She's affiliated with CS and Learn. Uh, her talk today is entitled Machine Learning to Understand and Improve Human Learning. You know how we set it up normally, so the speaker has one hour. Uh, I think Tanya plans for 45 minutes of presentation, then we have time for questions at the end. But the speaker agreed also to take questions in line. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand uh, and we'll try to take them uh, in for discussion. Thank you so much, Tanya, for your availability. And the screen is on yours. Hey. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction, Jan. So I'm heading the Machine Learning for Education Laboratory, which is at the School of IC. And I'm happy to have the opportunity to give you an introduction to the research that we do at our lab. So as you see in the title, our research focuses on machine learning to understand and let's say hopefully improve human learning. So over the last decade or over the last years, there has been a rise in the use of educational technologies because technology offers a lot of exciting opportunities for education. So technology, for example, has the potential to increase the motivation of the learner. So the digital environments are an attractive tool and we can make learning more game-like. Technology also has the potential to offer a completely new learning experience. So here you see two experiences by our lab. One is a virtual simulation of a situation in a pharmacy, and one is just a simulation of an interactive empirical phenomena. So educational technology also are available everywhere and at any time. And finally, and most important from my point of view, educational technology allows us to deliver a potentially completely personalized learning experience. So we can adapt the content to the specific needs of the user and thus um, optimize motivation and learning outcomes. So at our lab, we of course don't focus on all of these four potentials, but we mainly focus on providing individualization in environments that offer new types of learning experiences. So specifically, our vision is that we develop models and algorithms that enable us to give highly individualized learning tools. And our goal is not only to optimize content, so to transfer content knowledge, but especially to prepare students to learning on their own. So tackling these visions now requires research on one hand on the machine learning side, because if we want to offer individualized learning tools, we need to represent the knowledge or the behavior of the student or of the user in our system. So we need machine learning models. On the other hand, we also need research on the education or learning sciences side, because we need to investigate how we can assess and teach skills or strategies that are important for future learning. So um, why is this a difficult problem? So why is machine learning for education a challenge? There are three main challenges that we need to tackle. So the first one is to adopt state-of-the-art machine learning for education. So over the past decade, there has been a large increase um, in the use of deep learning and deep learning has revolutionized many fields and a lot of research in this field. However, it is only really sparsely used in the field of education. So why is this the case? There are three major barriers. The first barrier is that educational data sets are small. So we usually don't have millions of students interacting with our learning environments, but rather maybe a few hundreds. Um, education does not like black box models. So this is a human-centered field, and I cannot go with, to a teacher and say, oh, by the way, student X is struggling in your course. My model has predicted this. I just have no idea why, but I can tell you the prediction is will fail the exam. So this is not a useful model in practice. And then the third reason is that educational data sets are not only small, but also heterogeneous. Depending on what population we go to, we might have very, diff very big differences um, 
in terms of social background in the population, in terms of age, we have different genders. So having small and heterogeneous data sets makes the model prone to bias and unfairness in the model. So that's a challenge on the machine learning side. On the education side, the challenge lies in us understanding human how humans learn. So um, if we want to observe more complex learning processes, so not content knowledge like right, wrong answers, but how people explore an environment or how they solve a complex problem, suddenly our solution space gets quite big. And then also the catalog of possible learning strategies that we have now from learning science side or from theory is pretty small. So basically what that means is that we don't even know how an optimal trajectory in such an environment looks like. Yet we want to model it. Then the final challenge is a bit, bit derived from the first two channel challenges. It's generalizing across context. So we have this high heterogeneity. So what has been done in the past is that machine learning models usually are specific to a certain course. So I develop a model that works for my course. You will develop a model that works for your course and your population. So there's absolutely no transfer. And tackling this, um, as you will see later, is not so easy. So basically now having these three challenges in mind, how our research at the lab is built up is right across these three challenges. So we have the machine learning side, that's now in gray, where we want to develop models for education that can generalize, that we can explain, so they should be interpretable and that are fair. But then, of course, we also have the other side, which I call now very sloppy, the learning science side, where we have applications. So we want to teach strategies that are useful for learning with the increasing digitization higher order skills are very important. So how do you solve a complex problem? How do you find a pattern in a model? Um, how do you self-regulate your learning? So that's the learning science side. And then we have a little third ingredient or it's not a little ingredient, it's actually a big ingredient for us because to do our research, we need data. And this data usually comes from some digital learning environment. So we are using different types of environments. Um, simulation of interactive phenomenon, then our own environment, which is the virtual pharmacy, um, online learning journals here of chef apprentices and the spaghetti or other documentation systems. And what I will now do in the remainder of this talk is basically present one project from the gray area, one that is more in the blue area and one that is more in the red area. So we will basically move from the gray area from machine learning where we first talk about how we can develop models for traditional online courses, um, for which are also taught at EPFL, and how we can especially develop models that we can transfer between different courses. We will then move more to the blue part, and I will go over to describe how we can now predict success in a very different environment where students freely interact with the content, um, and how we can also transfer these models maybe between different types of simulations. And then finally, I will move over. So you see the point is moving a bit more to the right and talk about self-regulation in online learning, a topic that after COVID and with the many flip classroom and online classes is also very relevant for teaching at EPFL. So over the past decade, we had a large increase in the use of massive open online courses. So EPFL has, I think, the largest MOOC platform in Europe. But unfortunately, these courses suffer from high dropout rate and from low success rate. So it would be great if we could provide adaptive interventions to support students to actually learn in these courses. So imagine that you were teaching, this course ex actually exists, a course on urban city planning for the global south. And it's a course that is fully online. You have 5,000 students. Your course runs for 12 weeks. And after six weeks, you ask yourselves, are there students that are maybe at risk of dropping out of this course and failing the course um, that I would need to support? So you have seen 
your course for six weeks or seven weeks, not the full time, and you would want to support the students in need. And you would want to do that based on the clickstream data that you get. So these students, they access your videos, they access your quizzes, or they don't. They give answers, um, they stop videos, they restart them, so they interact with the online system, and you have collected all this clickstream data. So what we did now is that based on prior research, we categorize the clickstream data a bit. So we extract features by week. So we have a course of 12 weeks. We have 45 features, so we have 45 times 12 weeks. So for each week, we now extract these features. So engagement is, is just uh, what it actually is. So how many videos did I watch this week? How much time did I spend on the platform? Then there's more subtle features like, do I work regularly? So do I always work on Mondays? Or do I just work randomly across the week? So do I have a regular, regular working patterns? Um, am I up to date with the course content? Maybe I'm way behind, which would not be a good sign. And then a lot of control features. Um, do I usually just fast forward your videos? And where do I fast forward? Where do I do a break? Do I do breaks at all? So now, in a first attempt, we just take these 12 weeks times 45 features, we feed them into a neural network model, so a bidirectional LSTM here, and we predict whether the student passes the course or a student fails. So the issue is now that in our case of the urban city planning, we are only six weeks into the course. So of course, we cannot see in the future and we don't really know whether the students will pass or fail the course. This means that we need to use a model that was trained on another course because we cannot train our model on this course because we don't have the labels. So I call this the knife way. We just take any course. We know that we had a course on digital signal processing where we have all the data and we have labels and we just train our model on this course. And then to make a prediction on our course, we just use this model. So not very successful, we reach a balanced accuracy of about 65%. So that is not a very great result. So one hypothesis here is that, yeah, but maybe urban city planning and digital signal processing, that's, that's just so different topics. So maybe if we take a more similar course or similar topic, we can transfer better. But it turns out sometimes it works or sometimes it doesn't. So we take the same course that was taught in year one and in year five, and we can still not transfer well. So what is the issue here? The hypothesis here is that, of course, if we train a model on a specific course, the model will be optimized for this specific course. And everything that is different in our new course will hurt performance of our model. So the question is, can we do better? And yes, we can. We can do better. So instead of just training a model on one course, we just take many courses that we have available here at EPFL, 26 courses that we parsed where we have different instructors, different topics. So courses from math, courses from computer science, courses from social science, um, courses from bachelor's, courses from master, and we train the model to predict on all these courses. The hypothesis here is that if we have many different courses, the model will be less specific. And we see that this works, so we have a huge increase in balanced accuracy. So now we are more than 80% accurate after seeing only 60% of the course. But we can even do better than this. So now we trained on a very large corpus of courses and then we predicted on a new course. So what we will do next is we will hypothesize that maybe some courses in this corpus are more similar to each other than others. So it might have the content of the course might have an influence on how the students behave or the instructor that teaches the course or whether it's a master or bachelor student might have an influence. So we assume that if we knew which courses are similar to each other and we gave this information to our model, our model might make use of it. So I will not go in detail on how we do this. That's a small sketch. So what we will do is we will input the behavioral features on one side, and then on the other side, we will input information about the course. What information is this? This is information like 
an encoding of the title, an encoding of the course description, an encoding on how long the course is, so the duration of weeks, an encoding of what level it is, and so on. And we will take that into the model and train it at the same time. And then we have a further small increase in predicting. So we can do even a bit better, um, depend, depends a bit which course we have, we can do an, even a bit better if we take into account which courses are similar to each other. A bit of order. So now what I will not talk about now is that now, of course, we have uh, come from interpretable features to using a black box model, which uh, makes our approach not interpretable anymore. And then that's part of current research where we try to uh, use explainability methods from machine learning to explain the predictions of our model. But to summarize what is working here, what I have shown you is that, so the first thing that I have shown you not so surprisingly is that knife transfer just from one course to a completely different course doesn't work well, even if I can extract the same features for both courses. However, if I have a huge corpus of courses available, and by the way, we made the trained model available public so people can use it to predict on their own courses. So then that works pretty well. And if I can even provide meta information about my course such that the big model knows to which my course is similar, um, I can even transfer better. So that was an overview of a small project from, from the gray area. And now we will leave this world of online courses and do a big context shift to a very different type of environment. And these are interactive simulations. So I'm assuming that interactive simulations are much less known to this audience. So I will quickly explain open-ended learning environments. So what we mean by open-ended learning environments is environments where the student or the learner is not guided. So I don't get a task, then another task that I have to solve, but I get a big problem to solve or a big task to solve, and I can solve it using anything in the environment available to me. So the idea of these interactive simulations, they are used actually for science teaching. So the idea is that instead of the teacher teaching the student the equation and the student just apply them, the student will get the simulation and first explore and try to find some relationships and principles on their own. And, and the idea behind this is that if you discover something on your own, you will probably remember it more. The issue is that this is hard. This is difficult for many students. So again, we need to support them. Here we have two simulations. As you see, one is a circuit with a capacitor where you can change plate area, separation, voltage, and you could figure out um, how the equation for stored energy or for capacitance of a capacitor actually works. Then the right one is called Beer's Law Lab. So there's a law called Beer's Law that describes how light is absorbed in a fluid, depending on the concentration and the width of the flask. So what we have done at our lab is we have developed several tasks that students can solve in such environments. And today I will focus on ranking tasks only. So what are ranking tasks? So the idea is, this is actually for lab apprentices who are 15 to 19 years old. So they get a task here. So they have the simulation and they get the tasks and they get told that they have a wavelength of 520 nanometers in their laser. They have these flasks with a fluid in and the concentration, and they need to rank them by how much light is absorbed. So what is difficult here is that you cannot just reproduce this in the simulation because, for example, your concentration there doesn't go above 400. So what the apprentices are expected to do is that they figure out the relation between flask width or concentration in the simulation. So they figure out the law behind the principles and then use this law to actually do the ranking. And this is a very hard task, not only for apprentices, but also for physics undergrads. So we have done a similar type of task twice with two different simulations. And this idea of you need to rank by first exploring and figuring out the principles, and then you rank. 
So we had 190 students who are physics undergrads at the University of Colorado. And then we had 254 students who are from 11 vocational schools across Switzerland who are um, lab technician apprentices in chemistry. So a very different age range. So now what we are interested in here is to see how does the behavior in the simulation relate to what they learn later. So they have a simulation, they use it, they solve this ranking task, and then later they do a post test where we see how much of the concepts have they learned. And we try to use what they did in the simulation to predict how much they will learn in the post test. So how do we do this? Here, um, we make the observation. So it is not a Markov model. It looks very close, but here I, I realized that later that state and action might be confusing. But what I mean here is that the state of the simulation. So the simulation is in a certain state. The circuit is closed. And then I change the voltage. And then this changes the state of the simulation, right? So now the voltage has been changed and all the outcome variables have changed too. Then um, I do another action, the state of the simulation changes and so on. So I think the important thing to keep in mind here is that we cannot just encode student actions without context. So we cannot just say Tanya increased the area and she increased the area and she increased the area, but it depends. Um, the action needs to be embedded in a content. So how, in what state was the simulation when I did this? So to make this more concrete, so I might increase the plate separation in this capacitor lab simulation. Um, I did this when my electric circuit was closed. As you know, whether the electric circuit is closed or connected, this will make a big difference on what I observe. And I had was displaying the stored energy. So we encode every action like this. So we have a, a, for every action that the student does in the simulation, which basically every click, increase, 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 we have a vector of length, state, times action. And then as a first simple idea, we just use a random forest to predict whether students learn. And interestingly, we are really good in the electric circuit simulation, but uh, does not really work well for the chemistry lab simulation. So here on the, on the y-axis, you would see the area under the curve. And if this is 0 0.5, it would be random. So our model is not random, but it works much better for the capacitor lab simulation. Now, of course, it works better for the capacitor lab simulation because what I didn't say here is, but what is the truth is that also we first developed the feature extraction and the model for the capacitor lab simulation. Then we were very happy and said, okay, in the second year, we will now do it for another simulation. And that's what we saw. So the issue of the random forest, for those of you who have used random forest model is that of course it takes features of fixed input length as an input, and it's not really suitable for time series data. So in the next step, we just decided, let's use a model that can handle time series then. So let's use, a gated recurrent unit, which is a recurrent neural network model. And um, why do we use the gated recurrent unit and not an LSTM or a bi LSTM or anything? We try to use um, a cell type that uses a few lower number of weights because our data sets are small. <coughs> so if we do that here, we don't improve much, but there we are also already at 95 or 97%. So we are really high. But here, we improve um, substantially in accuracy. However, again, we have lost all. We are at the back black box. We were from the random forest where we could have feature importances. And we landed at the black box model where it will be really hard for us to explain any of our results. So what we did here is that we used attention in the neural network. So you might have seen attention used to increase performance of the model. I will show you that in our case, attention, that's the green model, will not really improve performance of the model at all. But our idea is that if we put the attention weights at, at the right point or in the right layer of the architecture, we can then later extract them from the model. And if we interpret these attention weights, we can kind of use them as feature importance score. So <laughs> they tell us where the model will have paid attention to. 
and I will show you the results here. So here, that's for the chemistry simulation. So how these attention weights are, you know, basically a matrix. And then the x-axis is time, so that's the timestamps. And then if it's dark in the matrix, that means it's a part where the model was paying attention to. So here, here for the chemistry simulation, we have the first four entries, which are the state of the simulation. So I had a green laser and the green fluid, or I had the green laser and the red fluid. I displayed absorbance. I did not display absorbance, and then all the actions that I did or that the student did. So what we can see here is that the state of the simulation is much more important than the actual action. So what does that tell us? So um, putting the education hat on, what this, what this does tells us in terms of education is that um, what is very important in this type of learning is setting up an experiment properly, which means that when I perform experiments, I need to have optimal experimental conditions such that I can actually read out something of my experiments. So what does this mean? Um, experimenting with the green laser and the green fluid, it's not necessarily wrong. But when you have a green laser and a green fluid, some people who know chemistry might tell you that this leads to very, very low absorbance, which means that if I do experiments and I double the width and I double the width, I might not really see much happening in absorbance and I will not be able to figure out the relationships between with at absorbance. If I have complementary colors like a green laser and a red fluid, absorbance is maximized, which means that if I manipulate something, so I double the width, um, I will observe exactly what happens to absorbance. So it's about setting up optimal experimental conditions that will help you learn. And then the second thing that we observed, by the way, also for the, not only for the apprentices, but also for the physics undergrads, so first year's bachelors, that is, you always will have 25, about 20% 20 of the students who will not even measure the right outcome variables. So you will tell them, rank by absorbance, they actually never measure absorbance, or rank by stored energy, 20% of the physics bachelor students will rank by capacitance instead which is uh, quite a big number. Um, so what do we learn from here? I think what we learn is that inquiry learning is hard. It is hard to assess um, and it is hard to teach, but we can develop models or we have done initial models that are able to predict how well students learn with these environments. So in the third and final part, I, we will do another context switch and we will now go more over to the learning science side. So over the past years with COVID, we have seen more and more online teaching. So we also have taught online or in flipped classrooms at EPFL. So students really like online teaching because it gives them flexibility in terms of time. However, on the flip side, teaching online also requires a very high degree of self-regulation on the student side. But this online teaching or flip classroom courses are only successful if the students actually prepare for the class and do the activities at home. And prior research has shown that quite a large part of the students lacks the motivation or just the self-regulation skills to actually do this at home. So maybe for those who are not familiar with self-regulation, I will first just give a quick intro. So self-regulation is just the ability to control, manage, and plan the learning actions. So it is composed of different dimensions. So effort regulation, so how persistent are you? How much work do you put into learning? Then time management. How do you plan your study time? Do you work regularly? Um, do you work a lot at the beginning of the semester and then maybe maybe motivation decreases or vice versa? Do you not work a lot? And then before the exam, there's a huge peak. Um, metacognition, so that's reflecting about your own learning. How much have I already learned? How much more do I need to learn? Critical thinking, carefully examining the material and then seeking help when necessary. So do I realize that I struggle and that I should look for help? 
So four of these are yellow, and these are actually the ones that we are able to measure in EPFL fleet classroom courses. So we have data from EPFL fleet classroom courses. So from the online part, where students watch videos and do quizzes from the EPFL platform, and we can measure these four dimensions. What we do here is we then measure these four dimensions and try to cluster students into groups that have different profiles in terms of these dimensions. So what we first do is we first measure each dimension separately and do clusters separately for each dimension with just standard clustering approaches. So we would get here one, two, three, six different clustering solutions. And then in the next step, so we would get uh, different types of efforts, different types of consistency. And then in the next step, we use K modes, which just uses the mode instead of the means and integrate everything together into a profile. So profile I could be, A could be students that have high effort and work a lot, that work very consistent over the semester, that are very regular and so on. And then profile J could be students that have a low effort, but work very consistently, so consistently low effort and so on. So now for each course, we can have patterns for the different dimensions and we can have integrated profiles. And what I will do next is just show you example patterns of existing EPFL courses. I will not tell you what they are, which course they are, and then show what we found also in terms of profiles. So for example, we have, that's a first year course, um, and that's consistency. That's how consistent do we work over the semester? You see, it's very interesting because 84% of the people are actually in the green cluster and work consistently and only 16% have a bit of a peak in the end. However, we look at a different course here, uh, I guess even without seeing it, uh, that's before the midterm. So we can see in this course, only 15% of the people do some work online here while the rest does basically nothing. And then in the week before the midterm, they work a crazy amount and then they stop working. And then before the final exam, they work. Um, so that's a different course. So we can analyze courses in terms of how the students behave in the course. And what we can then do, if we have done this for every dimension, we can now build profiles. And what is interesting in the profile um, for this course, the first year course, there we have built profiles. I will not tell you what the profiles are, but I would like to show you the demographics. Um, so on the left-hand side, failure rate, depending on profile, we see the purple profile higher than average failure rate. So the failure rate is so high because it's a first year class, so it's 40%. And profile E, much lower than average failure rate. You now look at the demographics. What we see is we have on generally 29% of female students in the course, very, Low, low amount of them is in profile D, over proportionally high amount is in profile E. So by the way, profile D has a suboptimal self-regulation behavior and profile E has an optimal self-regulation behavior. So it seems that female students profit more from a flipped classroom setting. And by the way, there has been um, research at the Center of Learning Sciences that um, on different courses that confirms that in the courses, um, if you compare flipped and traditional, the female students, pre, um, the female students profit from the flipped setting more than the male students. For the male students, there was not much to observe, but the female students profit. I thought that um, just an interesting finding that came out of this research. Another interesting observation that we made. Um, is that behavior changes over time. So it's not like you are a systematic person, so you will always work very systematically. So we applied this framework to online learning journals of apprentices where we can observe the apprentices over three years. So we can see for every semester in which group they land in. You don't need to see the detail here. You just need to see that this looks crazy. So we have a, a profile and we have a flow and we see that people flow between profiles. So it's not that an apprentice is very systematic and always stays systematic, but that her behavior changes a lot over the three years. 
So um, this was a short overview of the clustering framework that we mainly have so far come from the learning sciences side, try to build a model based on learning theory and try to use it to analyze the courses and the learning journals that we have to also give a feedback to the teachers um, how their systems are used by the students also as an input for potential improvement. So before concluding or to conclude, I just want to go back. So we have seen the gray, the blue and the red project. And the idea is on the gray side, the machine learning side to have models that are generalizable, explainable and fair. And also use these models in environment where we actually don't teach content, but strategies that are important for future learning. So I'd just like to emphasize this once more with the increasing digitizations, our students really need this type of strategies and therefore it is important that we teach these strategies to them. <laughs>